There are only two principles that the Buddha said are categorical. In other words, true across the board in all situations. One is the principle that skillful thoughts, words, and deeds should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. The other principle is the Four Noble Truths. Now you notice that the three characteristics aren't on that list. In fact, the word three characteristics is never applied by the Buddha to the teachings on inconstancy, stress, and not self. He calls them perceptions, and in a couple of cases they're also contemplations. Which means those are truths to be used at certain times when it's appropriate. And when you think of them in terms of the Four Noble Truths, they're basically teachings to be used in order to develop the path, to develop dispassion for suffering and to abandon its cause. In other words, they're to be used to do something to fulfill a duty. It's important to keep that in mind. You read the teachings of the Ajahns, and one of the interesting features they have is to talk about things that are not only inconstant, but also constant. Not only stressful, but, but also pleasant. Not only not self, but self. Think about that point that Ajahn Mahabhava made one time. He said, try to prove the Buddha wrong. And you can think about things and you say, well, there are certain things that are constant in the world. So, and John Lee points out, your lower lip has never turned into your upper lip. Your arm has never turned into your leg. The elements have always stayed the same. Solidity has always been solidity. It hasn't turned into anything else. So there is that constant aspect of things. Or as John Cha points out, the way in which things change is pretty constant. So you can latch on to the fact that things are constant. You can latch on to things are the way in which they're inconstant. Similarly with pleasure and pain. The Buddha himself points out that the five aggregates are not totally painful, not totally stressful. If they didn't have any pleasure, no one would be attached to them. And there are plenty of passages in the canon where they talk about the need to develop a skillful sense of self. At the same time, there are also passages that talk about not-self. Then again, with the forest of John, that John Lee talks about seeing the side of things that is inconstant, stressful, and not-self, and the side that is constant, easeful, and under your control. But the point is that you have to learn to let go of both sides. And John Mahabhu has a teaching, and when someone asked him one time whether nirvana was self or not self, and he says nirvana is nirvana. You have to contemplate not self in order to get there, but once you've gotten there, it's, it's something different entirely. And all of this relates to two main points that are important in the practice. One is that you see what the Ajahn's talking about when they talk about conventional truths. They don't contrast them with ultimate truths. In other words, they don't say, well, to say that there's such a person as Lionel or Isabella or Isaac or whoever is just a conventional truth, but saying that they're aggregates, now that's an ultimate truth. Instead, they contrast conventional truths with release, which means that even talking about everybody here in terms of aggregates would still be a convention. So these are conventions that are to be used. We're going to something that's not words, but we use the words, we use the truths. That's one important point, that we're not here to arrive at right view. We're here to use right view to go beyond. You have to have right view about right view, in other words, realizing that that's not the goal, it's part of the path. The other point is that they have something that they call vipassanupigilesa, these are corruptions of insight, and these can happen very easily when you're meditating, and you're, especially when you're off alone, and you come across some sort of experience that really impresses you with its truth or its power, and you latch onto it, saying, this must be true, this must be right. 
Well, we're not here to get to truthness or rightness. We use truths and we use rightness to go beyond them. But if you just latch on to them, you've misused them right there. It's one of the reasons that the Ajahns talk about going beyond right and wrong and true and false is because when you latch on to true and false, it can really cause you a lot of trouble. It can get in the way of any further progress on the path, especially if you believe you've arrived at some noble attainment simply because you've seen the truth of some teaching. So remember, these truths are here to be used. They're here to perform. They perform a duty and you put them aside. So that way you have right view about right view. You use the rightness of the, of the path. And it is a right path, because it works. But it is a path. We're working on developing dispassion. And so when you latch on to a truth, or you discover a truth, ask yourself, what's the use of this truth? In which ways is it useless? In which ways is it going to have a bad effect on your mind? That's what you always want to look at. What is the effect that this has on the mind? And if you see that it gives rise to passion, well, you treat it the same way you treat any pleasure or pain. There are certain pleasures, the Buddha said, that are totally harmless, and other pleasures can be bad for you. So you've got to abandon the pleasures that are harmful. The same way with truths. There are some truths that are harmful for your practice right now. For instance, you're trying to develop concentration. This is not the time to be thinking about the inconstancy and stressfulness of your concentration. You can think about inconstancy and stressfulness in terms of the distractions that pull you away. But for the concentration, you want to focus on what can you make constant here? What sensations can you develop in the body that are constant, even as the breath flows in, the breath flows out? How do you make them easeful? Easeful, pleasant. How do you get this under your control? This is an area that you don't apply the teachings of the three perceptions to. Or when you think about karma, there was that issue in one of the suttas where one of the young monks is asked by someone from another religion, what does the Buddha say is the result of action? And the monk says, um, the result of action is pain. And that wanderer had heard enough about the Buddhist teaching and said, that's not what I've heard from anybody else. You better check that with the Buddha. So the young monk goes back and checks. And the Buddha says, you fool. And then Udayan, who's a regular tr troublemaker in a lot of the suttas, says, well, maybe he was thinking about the fact that it gives rise to, actions give rise to feelings, and feelings are stressful. And the Buddha said, this is not the context for that. When you're talking about action, you're talking about skillful and unskillful actions, and you want to induce people to do skillful actions, that's when you point on the fact that skillful actions lead to things that are relatively pleasant. So there's a time and place for truths. And this is an important aspect of the teaching. We're not here to latch on to a truth, aside from using it. So you've got to see how it performs. Because you can describe the world in all kinds of ways, but which description is going to be best for giving rise to dispassion? There's that sutta where the monks are going abroad to a section that's not in the middle country in India. And before they go, the Buddha says, well, take your leave of Sariputta. So they take leave of Sariputta, and he says, well, intelligent people there ask you, what does your teacher teach? What are you going to say? He said, well, we'd really like to hear what you would have us say. He says, the first thing is our teacher teaches dispassion. He's not teaching three characteristics. He's not teaching, even there in that case, the Four Noble Truths or anything. Just teaching dispassion. Now, that's one of the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. But that's what all these teachings are meant to induce. Even when the Buddha gives the questionnaire on the three perceptions, is this constant or inconstant? What's well, inconstant? Is it something inconstant? Is it stressful or pleasant? Well, it's stressful. If it's inconstant and stressful, does it deserve to be self? Notice it's a value judgment. No, you're trying to develop dispassion through that questionnaire. That's what it's aimed at. It's supposed to perform. This is where you have to use your powers of, of judgment and evaluation. When you come across something in your meditation, we think, wow, this is really true. 
you have to ask yourself, true for what purpose? And what does it do to your mind, keeping this particular truth in mind? And if you see it's having a bad effect, you say, well, that's not the truth for right now. That's when you have to let the truth and falseness of that issue just be put aside. Because ultimately, with all these truths, you're going to, have to put them aside. But you want to get the best use out of them. Treat them as tools, as means to an end. And then you'll be safe.